Welcome everyone. We're now at the top of the hour. To begin our webinar presentation today, this webinar is titled Explore BioLink and Advanced Biotechnology Workforce Education. Today's April 1st, 2016, and it's just at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. My name is Mike Lasecki. I'm your host. I'm located here at the Maricopa Community Colleges. Your screen is changing now as I'd like to introduce you to the use of the system called Adobe Connect. Many of you have used it before, but let me point out a few features. We'll have some polling questions today. The polls will be displayed and it's going to come up right over the presentation area when I launch the polls. And then you'll just click on radio buttons uh, to respond and we'll see our results live. So that'll be an interesting way of interacting with us. There is a chat box which you can see on your screen right now. It's right to the right hand side and you can send in your questions just by typing them right into that window and then clicking on that speech balloon or hitting return, whatever it takes to, to send those questions through. We'll have a number of question breaks in today's presentation. I'll bring those questions forward and we'll have a discussion with our presenters with them. During the Q&A periods, you'll see me change the screen again. I'll, I'll reposition the chat window to give a little more visibility to the questions. So nothing's going uh, wrong there. It's just me changing the layout of the screen. Let's head over to our presentation. You'll see the screen change again. OK, here it comes. There we are. BioLink webinar series co-presented by the AC2 Regional Center. This webinar is recorded. I have begun the recording. And as a registered participant, you will have a link to that recording and the slides. It usually takes us somewhere between one and two business days to process these recordings and send them out to you. So yes, that's the, your answer to your first question. Is there a recording? The answer is yes, and you'll be getting it. BioLink is a national center in the Advanced Technology Education Program. Let me introduce our, our first presenter today. My colleague Elaine Johnson is the director of BioLink, headquartered at City College of San Francisco in California. Welcome, Elaine. Will you uh, say hello to everyone? And then please introduce your co-presenters. Thanks, Mike. It's uh, great to be here today to share some uh, thoughts with all of the uh, participants. And uh, I'm here in San Francisco, but I have uh, my colleague Jeanette Maury is at Madison Area Technical College in Madison, Wisconsin. And Sandra Porter is in Seattle at Digital World Biology, formerly at uh, Seattle Central and also at Shoreline Community College. And then Sulatha Warakarnoff is from Austin Community College and uh, will be uh, talking with us a little bit about the new regional center. Now, let me ask you a question. Does your college have a biotech program? If you could answer this poll, then we've got an idea of who's, who's all participating on the call. Well, some of each. <laughs> But uh, primarily the uh, programs that have, or the colleges or schools that have biotech programs. So that's great because now we'll be able to have you uh, provide comments as we go through this uh, webinar about what your college is doing, what you need, how BioLink can be of service to you, and how you can be of active part of BioLink. As we move on, uh, we could see the distribution of uh, the participants and I would like to remind you that the BioLink National Center has uh, been funded by the National Science Foundation as an advanced technological education 
Center since 1998. Uh, our goals over the years have shifted a little bit, but they, at the beginning, programs uh, were started by people in isolation from each other, and we could see that we would be much stronger if we could be working together. And so now we have about 110 community college biotech programs that are actively working with BioLink with these goals in mind to use this uh, robust network for sharing of information and fostering communities of practice that are meant to enhance the preparation of skilled technicians. We also are very much interested in deepening uh, and diversifying the industry outreach and to engage more of our industry partners in letting us know what their training needs are and to, for us to be able to respond to those. And then, of course, we are interested in students and increasing access to and the use of educational and training resources to improve the skills enhancement of students. We have a lot of resources. Many of those resources are actual people, and so we don't want to forget that. But we've got a lot of resources on our website, uh, and you see some of these listed here. I'm going to talk about some, and the other presenters are going to be talking about some as well. But I would like to remind you that one of the resources of BioLink is a way for you to disseminate uh, your own information and so when you think about resources, don't think about them only as something that you're getting, but this is also an opportunity for you to give back, to share information with others, and to uh, use that as a, dissemin a large uh, dissemination uh, resource. We have just, sent, or we, meaning Sandra Porter, has uh, just finished upgrading the website, and she'll be talking to you about that. But you'll notice that it's a little bit different than it has been in the past, and uh, much, much better. There are a few things happening as far as uh, professional development opportunities this year, and one of them is the fact that the Bio International Convention is coming to San Francisco in June, the first week in June, and we have a community college program on Monday, June 6th, in conjunction with the National uh, Bio Conference. The registration is $175, and that includes breakfast, lunch, and most importantly, a pass to the exhibit hall. You can register either on the BioLink website or on our sister center, the uh, biomanufacturing.org. We're uh, all, all the uh, biotech centers are working together to put this day together, and it should be a wonderful opportunity to network and to also experience some of the activities of the uh, Bio International Conference. The next day, we're going to move over to the uh, Clark Kerr campus for those of you that uh, want to spend the week at the BioLink Summer Fellows. And this is June 7th through 10th at the Clark Kerr campus at the University of California, Berkeley. You can register and you can request a fellowship. And the fellowships are, uh, we have the deadline as March 31st, but since this webinar is on April 1st, we want to extend that through uh, April 4th so you can uh, apply to get a fellowship, and we hope that you will do that. The fellowship does not include the travel expense, but it includes the lodging, the food, and the registration fee. In addition to that, we're going to have a wonderful opportunity at the High Tech Conference in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is July 25th through the 28th. And uh, again, there's, uh, there are uh, some opportunities, and BioLink is a sponsor. And so we have 25 registrations available. And if you would email me uh, your interest in getting one of those registrations, 
I'll give you a code. And so you've got my email there, and you can uh, ask for one of the registrations, and we would be delighted if you could use it. I've got a couple other things that I'd like to talk about. One of them is the BioLink Depot that's been in operation since 2002. And this one happens to be in San Francisco, but we're moving uh, to start other depots in other parts of the country. This is just an example of our last open house in January where you can see how many uh, supplies and pieces of equipment are being picked up by teachers. We had at that one open house, this is kind of a typical open house, 104 people with uh, some people coming together from the same school. So we had uh, 77 actual teachers and uh, gave away about $126,000 worth of uh, equipment and supplies. And you can see how the kinds of things people are taking away. What we're reporting today that the BioLink Depot has just obtained a 501c3 status. And we're uh, looking forward to uh, our own sustainability. So we're kind of in a transition place where we're uh, working together with our partners, Austin Community College, Madison Area Technical College, uh, and our, our other sister centers around the country to uh, figure out how we can sustain this great effort that has begun. So Mike, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Elaine. You know, there are several questions have come in. It has to do about, I guess they're financial questions. I'll start with the, the one that's most current here. You showed that picture of a gentleman loading stuff into the back of his car, and you mentioned $126,000 of things given away. Do you mean you literally give away the equipment? Can anybody show up and say, I would like one of those spectrophotometers? I mean, how does it work? It works. Uh... I guess yeah, that was a really good question because I failed to say that this is these everything we give away is donated from industry. So we have at one open house, for example, we had 42 refrigerators, three minus 80 freezers, two minus 20s, and we have so far uh, given those away completely. But we've got a way of registering. We have a, a very good system so that we ask people for identification. They, we ask them, are they teachers? Where are they teaching? We don't give, it's not just anybody that can come in and pick something up and then sell it on eBay, for example. We, don't, we want to make this resource available for distribution of supplies and equipment to teachers that are teaching laboratory uh, courses. And so far, we have had only one incident since 2002 where uh, uh, someone other than a teacher came, and we were able to just cordially say, you know, this is for teachers only. So that's, okay. that's the answer to that. That's a, that's a very interesting model. Um, and I guess it's a way that industry can, I could just see industry wanting to work with you, essentially you being the broker to, to make this happen. It makes a lot of sense keeps uh, all of this, these uh, pieces of equipment out of the landfill. So we're really doing a service to the companies as well by taking it away. We've had some funding from the Genentech Foundation to get started. So we've got uh, money to pay a person to be uh, operating the depot. We have about 40, 40 volunteers that help. So it, it turned out to be something that is a way that we and we work together too. It's the all. It's a it's an interesting dynamic of networking that happens at the depot as well. Right. One more question, Lane, before we move on to our next presenter. Uh, people were interested in that summer fellowship that you talked about. You listed seven hundred dollars on that um, on That's the screen here. there. We were confused. Do we have to pay $700, or do we get $700? We get 
it means that that's, it's worth, the fellowship is worth $700. Some people pay, and some people build it into their own uh, awards so that they have, uh, over the years, when they write for a project, an ATE project, for example, they'll include uh, funding for themselves to come to the Summer Fellows. And some of the people that are on the call have done that uh, in the past. So it's a, it's, uh, we have a, a certain number of fellowships, and as we get the applications in, we can look and see who, who's applying, whether they've come before. We give priority to new people. But uh, yeah, they can pay $700. Their school can pay $700. Uh, there are other funding sources, but uh, the uh, fellowship itself is worth $700, and that would okay. be free. Good. That clarifies that. Elaine, what, let me advance uh, to our next presenter. We're perfectly on time so far. I'd like to welcome Sandra Porter, who's going to talk to us about biolink.org and the biotech careers. Go ahead, Sandy. Thanks, Mike. So what I'm going to do today is touch on the different kinds of web resources that BioLink has to offer. So we have two websites. Uh, BioLink, the, the main website is BioLink.org, or sometimes www.BioLink.org. <laughs> and we've got a biotech careers site that has been made specifically for teachers and students. So the main site, BioLink.org, has information about about BioLink, about degrees and certificates, about professional development opportunities and resources for instructors, and about the different communities that BioLink interacts with and supports. We uh, serve three, three kinds of customers. For students, we give them information about careers, about colleges, about internships, about industry, and about jobs. For instructors, we help instructors with giving them a way to showcase their different biotech programs to connect with each other and find out what's out there and what other programs are doing and provide professional development. And for employers, we give them tools that they can use to evaluate the different biotech programs and w ways to make connections with different programs. And now, recently, we're, we've added a way that employers can advertise jobs to the BioLink community. We also have a lot of different communities that we connect with through social networking. We have a Facebook page, a Twitter account, link, a large LinkedIn group with about 5,000 people. We have a Flickr account with all sorts of pictures, and we have lots of YouTube videos. On the main site as well, if you visit, there is information about different kinds of events, so professional development events in biotechnology. You can see right there's the webinar right at the top. We have different sorts of blogs and newsletters that we put out roughly every month. We have a newsletter you can sign up for. We have, and of course we have ways to become members because we have a lot of different kinds of members. We have student members now, we have industry members, we have affiliates who are with different, bio, different kinds of oh, ATE projects, and we have uh, high school affiliates, and we have uh, all of our college programs. And at the bottom, we have a site map, so you can get to any different part of the site pretty quickly. So just diving into one of the sections, uh, one of the most popular sections is one that we use to describe all of the different kinds of degrees and certificates that BioLink programs offer. There are about 111 different college programs across the United States that are part of BioLink. And between them, they offer 37 different kinds, I know, 37 different kinds of degrees and certificates that are related to biotechnology. Anything, anywhere from bioprocess laboratory technology to biostatistics to biotechnology, of course, biotechnology education, clinical research, all kinds of different degrees. With each degree, if you were to click on Learn More or the title, you'd get a description of the types of classes that would be required for students who are taking enrolled in that program. You'd get links to the biotech career sites to show you people who are actually, our students who are actually working in those jobs and what they do, and links to related degrees and related resources. 
at the bottom of, of each degree page, and this one is from biotechnology, you can see a map of the United States and where the programs are that offer the different kinds of degrees. And for each program, we put in information about, there's a little icon to show you if, if it's a certificate, if it's a post -bac certificate, if it's an associate's degree, if it's a master's degree. So you could get a quick idea about what's out there and where you would go if you wanted to learn this technique. I mentioned that biolink.org is largely, one, one big function of, of our site is to showcase all the different biotech programs across the country. Here, if I look at a state, and you would, I would get there from the, from the site map, if I go to Texas, I can see here that there's quite a few programs in the state of Texas. I can see where they're located. And notice there's a little purple uh, marking in the middle. We have just recently started adding high school affiliates. So we have information about where the high schools are located too, because we'd like the high schools and the community colleges to partner and provide smooth transitions for students who, are, who want to learn more about biotech. If I dive in and look at one of the programs, and I just picked Austin here as an example, you can see that we list the different certificates that are available of that program and the different here we have uh, Biotech is the Kind, and it looks like there's three different certificates that Austin offers, a certificate, sorry, a certificate, an associate's degree, and a post -bac certificate. We list all the faculty at that college who belong to BioLink. We uh, have links to their program website, and we have a map, and underneath the, what we've done with our maps is we have constructed queries so that if you click the link below the map, you get a, Google, a live Google search of, say, all the biotech companies in that area or all the research institutes in that area. Or you can go back to the state and see all the information for that program from that state. We can also see for each program where students have been employed. And now this information I should mention is largely up to the programs themselves to contribute. So we have them. They can update it at any time, and they have control over what this looks like. We view our, our site, it's not just a brochure to tell people what biotechnology is all about and the kinds of different degrees and certificates that you can get. One of the big functions of our site is actually to collect data. And a lot of that data is provided, as I mentioned before, by the programs. I'm showing you two of the kinds of reports that we offer on our site. One is a report that shows where students have been hired, and we have for each program that's entered this information, all the companies, okay, and the states they're in, and you notice at the top, it gives you different out the number of companies that hire from different programs. Amgen, I think, is one that's hired from nine different BioLink programs, which is very helpful for us programs themselves to know. Uh, if we look at the report on the right, this report is giving us information about the different kinds of degrees and credentials. And it shows us these are those 37 different degree types I mentioned. It shows us the number of programs that offer those kinds of degrees and whether they're actually degrees or certificates. Really, I should just call them all credentials. And we can, we can sum those up and get, a, get kind of a snapshot of the state of biotechnology across the country and what different programs are doing. And you can see here we've got 83 different programs <laughs> in BioLink are offering some kind of credential in biotechnology. Not really a surprise, but it's interesting to see here that there's 11 that are offering credentials in biomanufacturing, which is a growing, growing area. So BioLink.org, as I mentioned before, that's our main resource. But we realized a while back that we really wanted to have information as well about, oh, what do, what do different jobs pay? How would you find a job? What are careers like? And to showcase our students as well. So to accomplish that, we set up a second site that we call bio, it's biotechcareers.org. At biotechcareers.org, we divide information by job area, like nutraceuticals or medicine or vaccines and by job title. And we tried to pick the real titles that are used on the job because 
these are kind of mystifying to students. I mean, who knows what a pilot plant operator is, unless you're familiar with biomanufacturing. So we take this information, we describe it, we put information about the starting wage and yearly salary, and we kind of de demystify it so that students could understand a little bit better what these sorts of jobs are. We have a tab here in the middle that goes to education and training, and that information is linked to the programs that offer this particular degree that would be used to get this kind of job. There is also, you see a tab that says job search, and those from that tab we have real-time job searches that take you right to live sites. So a student could actually see, well, are there jobs as environmental health and safety technicians? And where are they? And what states and what do they pay? What are they offering? We put some other information, well, a lot of information at biotechcareers.org as well. We have videos of people on the jobs and interviews and lab tours. We have photo journals, which I'll show you an example of in a minute, that feature our own graduates in, on the job, show them working in different kinds of careers. And we know one of the challenging things about biotechnology happens to be all the different three-letter acronyms that people use. INDs, SOPs, QA, QC, GMPs. So we built a little, a fun little quiz that students can take before they go out to look for a job or when they're researching careers so they can learn the words and decipher all these mystical abbreviations. So lastly here I want to talk about uh, our photo diaries. This is one of our graduates from Shoreline Community College. What we ask our graduates to do is to provide some pictures of themselves on the job and the kinds of equipment they're using. And we have a survey that we ask them about. We ask them what college they attended, and we link to their school, what kind of degree they got, what it's like on the job, what sorts of skills they use during the day, what kinds of recommendations would they have. And we really wanted to do this because we wanted to show students who might be thinking about a biotech career that it's really not just 80-year-old white guys who are out working in biotechnology. It's, it's people like them. And we wanted to show them that there are careers that are available to students with high school degrees, with two-year degrees, and any degree thereof. But you don't need to go to school for 15 years to get a degree in bio, to get a job, a, a nice, satisfying career in biotechnology. And we will be talking more about the Biotech Careers site in one of our upcoming webinars. But for now, Mike, are there any questions? Sandy, there are several, but first let me say that Elaine has been singing your praises, telling me you should have seen what Sandy has been doing. Holy cow, I am really impressed at, at the depth that you have in your site here. I wonder if we could hire you to do the same thing for our center here. That's my first question. I'm just, I'm just saying that somewhat lightly, but that, that um, what you've done uh, there in, in terms of employment. I'm sorry, can you hear me now, Sandy? Well, we can talk about, uh, yeah, it's good. We could talk about that offline. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thanks. But um, uh, here's the question for you. The first question that came in about the student job site, is it a two-way in a sense? I see the students are able to look at job postings, but do you intend to or do you now host any student resumes that an employer might have access to? Is it a one-way or a two-way? Yeah, it, it, it's a one way. We, at one time, yeah, we, we haven't started posting resumes yet. And we have just recently started posting job jobs from employers. So this, this is kind of a new thing we're getting into and we're experimenting. They look like a, that you're linked to a feed from Simply Hired. Is that what you do there, that you, you uh, connect to their feed? Is that the way it works? No. Oh, no, no, it's not a feed. What we do is we we have links to their site with pre with queries we constructed, oh. so that instead of going to simply hired and typing QC analyst, we would make a query with that term, okay, and then link yes. to that, so they could just click simply hired and it would take them to a list of jobs. 
That's cool. There's another question that came in. It says, what about real-time job searching? That's exactly what that is. So if you were to go to I the think site so. and go to job search and click that link, you get things that have been posted. You, you get information that's available today. It, it, the query conducts the search. Excellent. When you click uh, the oh, link. One other question that came in. Yeah. Right, right. That's really well done. Another question that came in is, are there uh, costs for participating in some of the services that you've talked about here? I mean, are there charges for this? They didn't seem to be. There, there aren't any charges at this time, but this may be something that we implement as we move towards sustainability. It's, a, it's something we're thinking about. Interesting, very interesting. Sandy, thanks very much. We're, we're just perfectly on time here. I'd like to move on to, I'm going to increment our slide to Jeanette's section, and there may be some more questions that come up. We may call you back for that, uh, Sandy, but thank you for that presentation. Uh, welcome, Jeanette. Why don't you tell us about your uh, the curriculum and instruction materials that BioLink has to offer? Go ahead, Jeanette. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, since the beginning, BioLink has been involved in providing quality curriculum and instructional materials uh, as uh, to teachers as they teach in workforce uh, education programs. And on the website, as you probably saw in some of the other slides, there are two major uh, sections, the curriculum clearinghouse and courses in a box section. Those are really important, but I'm going to start off by talking about two big projects that we have going on that are really uh, focused on giving teachers the resources they need to teach. And um, the, the two projects uh, are listed here. The first one is about identifying core skill standards for bioscience technicians. And, and this is a result of a collaboration uh, with the 12 College Consortium that's funded by a Department of Labor TAC uh, grant, Round 2 grant. BioLink is a major partner in this grant. And um, this is a, a college consortium led by Russ Reed of Forsyth Tech. Um, the second project I'm going to talk about, which actually relates back to core skill standards, is uh, a collaboration with Pellet Productions uh, to produce uh, an interactive movie to teach quality and regulatory affairs. And some of you may know Pellet Productions because they are the, uh, it's a great company that produces the uh, Advanced Technology Education, ATE-TV, which is not just about biotechnology education, but it's about all of technical education, workforce education. They also do other nonfiction uh, productions. Um, so first, let me talk a little bit about the, the Skill Standards Project. Oh, first we have a poll. <laughs> um, do you currently use standards in reviewing and or designing curriculum? So I'll give you a minute to answer that. Um, I should. You've got an interesting distribution there, uh, yeah. Jeanette. Yes, it moved, it moved a bit here and there. It's, it's kind of tricky because maybe you've reviewed them, but you haven't actually used them, so you might have trouble answering the question. So I'm, I'm perfectly open uh, in questions after the presentation if we have time, or you can email me um, if you have specific questions about the skill standards I'm going to talk about. I'm going to move on. So in this particular, um, sorry, there's stuff on there. Um, in this particular uh, project, we're trying to focus on the core skill standards that are needed by all entry-level technicians across industry subsectors. And that you have to know a little bit about the way this Department of Labor grant was organized in order to understand our process. It's basically as three industry subsector hubs, biomanufacturing, laboratory skills, and medical devices, and, um, and then also a learning technologies hub. And each of those industry subsector hubs is represented by three uh, different colleges. And laboratory skills is led by BioLink. Biomanufacturing hub was led by NBC2 Center, which many of you are familiar with. And the medical device hub was led by um, Sang Young Lee at Ivy Tech in Indiana. 
And as part of the, the uh, effort to develop these core skills that are in common across those industry subsectors, uh, one representative from each of these hubs was appointed to be part of a working group. Uh, from medical devices, Vivian on Winward was the representative. From biomanufacturing, Linda Rafus was. And from laboratory skills, um, I was the representative. And we met over a series of different uh, meetings across a couple of years to identify and develop uh, the standards, to develop consensus language that everyone would be happy with, uh, and to really dig deep into what performance indicators, key activities, and all that sort of um, thing that goes along with skill standards. So that publication will be coming out in, in May. That uh, it's, being, it's a bilingual publication written by John Cleese and myself. And you can also find um, those skill standards on the, the site that's listed there. That's a dedicated uh, site to the skill standards. So um, many of you may wonder, well, why more skill standards? Um, comprehensive skill standard sets have been around since the early 90s. Um, and you know, they, they tend to be trying to identify all of the skills that bioscience technicians need. There have been several different attempts at those, and, and those were we actually used those, um, draw, we drew on those quite heavily in trying to find out what the core was. Um, but in this case, um, we, we focused on fundamentals. Because of the maturation of the bioscience industry, there are so many subsectors of the industry, so many different technical avenues, so many different technical workforce needs, depending on the industry and the company. And that leads to a, a huge diversity of, of technician job descriptions out there. And workforce education programs, as Sandy indicated, there are, there are, they, they just multiply to try to meet the industry demand for these technicians. And they're called different things, but they're all trying to meet some, some sort of bioscience technician uh, workforce need. And so in our, in our preparation programs, we have limited instructional time. Sometimes these are certificate programs, sometimes diplomas, sometimes associate degrees. But we really need to, uh, focus on fundamentals as we develop the credentials and the career pathways that students might be able to use to, get, to build their careers. And also, we want to review our existing curriculum, even if we have been reasonably successful in finding our students' jobs and, and in educating them for the workforce. We want to review it and make sure we're still um, focusing on the fundamentals that, that students need. And, and there's an even more important reason, I think. I think as educators, we tend to be uh, really excited about new developments, new technical avenues that are opening up in biotechnology, like stem cells and genomic editing and cool mass spec techniques. And it's great to teach those things and, and be blown away by new equipment. But we really need to focus on the fundamentals, not neglect those fundamentals that get students hired and promoted. Because often our industry tells us that. When we really listen to them, they say these are the, these are the important things. So as you might imagine, what are those, those key core standards that everyone needs? And this is just the top layer, the bucket layer of the, of the skill standards. Uh, these are the critical work functions. In each critical work function, there are many key activities and uh, performance indicators, assessments that support these. But as you can see, and you might imagine, safety, documentation, uh, mathematical calculations, Measurement. Measurement comes up time and again, not in the sense of a specific measurement, but understanding metrology, understanding uh, how to troubleshoot equipment, uh, uncertainty in measurement, calibration, verification, those kinds of things. And then the biggie here is complying with applicable regulations and standards, how to teach students about working in a regulated environment. And that's why I put the little arrow there, just because uh, my next uh, project I'm going to talk about really focuses on that particular critical work function. So another place you can find, if you don't want to write down the long URL for the um, skill standards, you can go to the main homepage of the BioLink website, type core skill standards in the search box, and that will lead you to uh, the skill standards. So the second uh, project I want to talk about really supports the skill standards, especially that for one particular critical work function on quality regulations and standards. And this is the production of that interactive movie. And it, this movie, uh, people in the industry call this a choose-your-own-adventure movie. Um, and in this movie, it, it documents the production uh, by a uh, 
fictitious biotechnology company, a biologics company called Franklin Biologics, named after Rosalind Franklin. And it follows the production of a, a biological drug, biologic drug, through um, the entire sequence of the production. And along the way, the characters in that movie are presented with various workplace scenarios, which require action or a decision on their part. And when you're watching the movie as a viewer, you get to choose a particular decision or avenue that that character will play. Uh, and that allows you to see the consequences of a particular, particular decision. So we, we really feel like this, because it is a human touch, it shows real people dealing with their real lives and making decisions along the way as they work in a company. We really think this will be an important uh, adjunct for teachers as they try to uh, tell students about the biomanufacturing uh, regulated workplace. The filming is complete. As you might imagine, filming is um, of this kind of movie is, is quite detailed because it's not just this continuous time sequence. There have to be you know, um, avenues that go off in one direction or another. It kind of resembles a bunch of different phylogenetic trees, the way the script was written. Um, and now um, that the filming is complete, the editing is in, in progress. Uh, we're hoping opening night will be at Summer Fellows. We're planning that, and we think we'll make that. And it will be, uh, the movie will be linked from the BioLink website when it's complete. So I just have to say a little bit more about this movie because it was such an awesome experience for us. My colleague Lisa Seidman and Vivian on Winward uh, and myself, we were allowed to go and participate. I guess participate might be too strong a word, but we were able to watch the entire filming process for a week. The filming took place in uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, their biomanufacturing training facility there uh, at Worcester Polytechnic in Massachusetts. And um, we were the educational experts. And that just means that our only role was to point out when something really didn't meet our educational goals. The technical expertise was provided by the people at Worcester Polytechnic. They do this all the time. They have great equipment. They have great facilities. And uh, their stories, the people who work there, were, were also really interesting. And we took advantage of having uh, cameramen at our disposal to film their stories. We were able to film all kinds of sidelines and, and how to use a particular piece of equipment. So we think once we actually organize all this great material, it'll be a, a wonderful resource for teachers. And there will be, we hope, a webinar coming up that's dedicated just to that particular interactive movie and how teachers can use it. So this is our big break. Um, you'll see um, Elisa Seidman on the left, myself on the right. We were actually got to be extras in the, the Franklin Biologics uh, company meeting. Um, and we were actually on the film. And these are the three actors and the, the main characters in the movie. This is the cameraman. And this is uh, uh, one of the, the director and another cameraman. So our big break, we finally got to be film stars. So I have to say a little bit about courses in the box because that supports all of the other um, skill standards that I've, I've mentioned earlier. And there are other resources that go along with the interactive movie found there. So you can link to the courses in a box section of our website by the home page of the BioLink website. And I will stop for a poll. Have you ever used the course in a box section of the BioLink website? Jeanette, cool. give me just a minute. Oh, there we go. OK. There's the polling questions. Thank you. So sort of an interesting split. A number of people have, but a number of people want to hear more, uh, Jeanette. So that's, that's actually um, in the next slide of the courses that are up there and how they support the, um, the skill standards. So we have, this is a list uh, of the courses in a box that are, that are on the site right now. And what we mean by a course in the box is that it's almost everything a teacher needs to teach a particular course. Now, some teachers don't use it in exactly that way. They may take sections of this for their own courses. But it's designed to really include lesson plans, PowerPoint lectures, quizzes, exams, um, everything, in some, in some cases, videos that show how to teach a particular thing. 
Um, and for that reason, you need an educational uh, email address or you need to get approval from, uh, actually from Sandy Porter to uh, have access to the, to the Course in a Box site. But there are a number of uh, courses that deal directly with the skill standards that I mentioned earlier, those important core fundamentals. There's the basic lab methods in a regulated environment sec, uh, course, which deals with weighing and measuring and all the aspects of uncertainty and measurement, documentation, and starts to talk a lot about uh, quality uh, culture in a quality and regulated environment. We have um, a hazardous materials course, which deals with the safety component um, that in the skill standards. We also have um, uh, quality regulations and standards, which is a uh, actually two courses, one from Austin Community College, one from Seattle, um, no, not Seattle, Salt Lake Community College. And um, those, those materials are actually going to be, we're going to draw on those materials as we come up with our webinar and our teaching resources that go along with our interactive movie. But those are already up there for your use. And then, of course, we have to have a, a laboratory calculation course that is uh, based on Elisa Seidman's book. I forgot to mention that basic laboratory methods in a regulated environment is also based on Lisa Seidman's book. Well, I've got everybody here. So those are already out there, and there's a lot of really uh, a wealth of information that can be used by teachers already there. So to wrap up, I want to do the coming soon slide. Uh, we are going to have an opening night for that interactive movie at the Biolink Summer Fellows. Um, and there will be a workshop pre-conference workshop at the high-tech conference, which you heard about from Elaine also. Uh, and that's titled Using Story in an Interactive Movie to Immerse Students in a Regulated Workplace. And um, then there will be a publication in May uh, on the, it'll be a booklet on the BiLink um, uh, course stand, skill standards publication. So that's coming soon. And so now I'll turn it back to Mike to see if there's any questions. You know, Jeanette, there was several about the uh, the movie experience. Actually, it sounds really great. I'm I'm interested in seeing that because I I know the quality of the work that Pellet Productions does in this choose your own adventure format must be really cool. Here was the question: uh, Did you have your own movie trailer, or did you at least I mean, you know, a physical trailer that you could wait in, or did you get one of those director chairs with your names on the back of it? <laughs> No, no, but we did have, they actually had to move us around a little bit. We had our own room always um, in, in the, uh, the facility there because it was an actual teaching facility, so, oh. but they, they, they dedicated it to us, so occasionally we were in a little lab space, sometimes we were in a conference room, sometimes we were right behind the scenes through a glass, you know, there would be glass windows there so we could see exactly what was going on. Lisa Seidman took copious pictures, she had tons of still photos and some videos yeah. of her own. So um, it was, and we got to see makeup and, you know, all the different kinds of costumes. Wow. And, yeah, it was really quite an experience. That's cool. Hey, um, there's a question that's come in from one of your presenter colleagues, uh, Sandy. Sandy, why don't you turn on your mic and, and ask uh, Jeanette that question, because there was another one about industry's role in the skill standards. Sandy, why don't you start us off with your question? Okay, Jeanette. Um, I was wondering, since I, I do know you put a lot of work into this, can you describe how, how you worked with industry to validate the skill standards? Yeah, and, and I, I was trying to be quick. It's kind of a challenge to be this quick about this because these are two pretty big projects. So there, there's a big piece of this, which was the industry verification or validation process. Uh, industry was in, involved in one way or another throughout the whole process. Uh, and the, the first line would be that, you know, we all have industry advisory boards and all of us have been either work, have either worked in industry or certainly dialogued with industry placing interns for, you know, 20 years or so. So that's the first line of it that went into the first draft. But then we also ask um, industry, active industry people through various avenues, uh, an online survey, uh, also the uh, National Advisory it's not a visiting committee, but it's an advisory council for the DOL grant was involved, and they participated in the survey to validate um, whether or not these were actual skills needed by entry-level technicians. And pretty much, I mean, there's a little bit of, of no, we don't need this coming from a, a startup company with regard to some of the quality regulations and standards piece, 
But really, that's the only thing that was even a little bit of a 93% versus 100%. Most of the other was 100% agreement. So yeah, we did have we did have an industry validation process, um, and and industry a lot of industry people say they they may use this in their they're experimenting with how they might use this in their own training programs or in their own evaluation program. Thank you, um, Sandy and Jeanette. One more question, and then we'll move on. Um, you, you talked about credentialing. Is there a recognized national credential that might be based on skill standards? Maybe not. But is there an industry credential for biotechnology technicians? Um, the short answer to that would be no. Okay, and there is so much variation as we were talking, as we talked about, so much diversity that yes. that really. And we're not even sure, depending on who you ask, whether industry really would want that or not. Um, and it, it just, there isn't a real good way to go about it. I think this is a kind of a first step for getting agreement of what's important. But I don't know that we're really to the step of a credential that's nationally recognized or that's industry recognized. You know, that's interesting, Jeanette. There's some uh, parallels with our own industry here, the semiconductor manufacturing industry, doesn't really desire a national credentials. They, they want the skills, but they're not ready or don't really desire that. And I think it's the same in your case as well. Yes. I okay. would agree with that uh, as well. And also, we just had a meeting in California, and some of the colleges are pushing to have uh, uh, students take the exam for quality through ASQ and yes. just because they learn this in their classes and then they are prepared to take the exam. So it's not through BioLink, but it would be including some um, other uh, certificates or credentials that are already available. Yeah, and the skill standards piece that we're putting into the core skill standards would sort of set the stage, I think, for students who wanted to pursue a little bit more along that line. Sure. Well, thank you both. And thank you, Elaine, for chiming in there, too, for your comment. Let's move into our final section today. And we do, we do have a final question period. There's a couple of ones in the chat window that I want to address as we get into that final session. I'm going to take us forward uh, and uh, have Sulatha tell us more about the AC2 BioLink Regional Center there at Austin Community College. Go ahead, Sue. Thanks, Mike, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as a part of uh, BioLink Sustainability uh, Program, we have a regional center that just got set up um, recently. And I'll give you a glimpse of what they are doing and talk a little bit more about uh, the CRO center that has been uh, quite successful at the Austin Community College, which we want to expand uh, going forward. Um, this AC2 BioLink Regional Center, um, the PI for that grant is uh, Linnea Fletcher. Um, by the way, the AC2 BioLink Regional Center is also funded by NSF ATE. Uh, the co-PIs for that is uh, Rob Hazardil, and we have Bridget Kirkpatrick, Deborah Davis, and the uh, coordinator for all this is Purnima Rao. Now, this is like a consortium of colleges that have come together to form a regional center. The regional center uh, is based out of Austin Community College, but we have Dallas, we have uh, Corpus Christi, and we have uh, uh, some other colleges in Texas. And then we have uh, Kentucky, where Deborah Davis is located. This, they all work together to uh, form this consortium or the BioLink Regional Center. This was uh, this is a very very new uh, center. It is started in uh, September 2015, and it's a four-year program that is going to be working on variety of different aspects. And so they are at the point where they're gearing up all the activities that I will be talking about. This is the website. You can uh, uh, go to BioLink main website and then get a link to this AC2 BioLink Regional Center. Now, the goals for this center are various different things. 
the, the one of the goals is to develop the BioLink mentor network where you know you grow biotechnology programs in high school, two years and four year school. And you also create a uh, validated level one certificate again in high school, two and four year school. You also promote undergraduate research uh, in biotechnology and biology for basically recruiting students into biotechnology related careers. Industry likes this a lot because they have some experience doing research. So uh, then you, we, you, we also have uh, a goal of promoting uh, contract service organizations at community colleges. Uh, we call this service, but it's basically contract research organizations. This is service because it's, I'll explain why more as we go along. Um, we'll de uh, and the other goal is to develop and implement statewide articulation agreements between two years, four years, and all high schools and everybody else. And we also look at emerging uh, workforce trends, um, for example, uh, bioinformatics, medical devices, there are um, many different ones that emerge as we go along. So moving on to this uh, contract research organization or contract service organization, they're pretty much the same, one and the same, but uh, in, in a community college setting, we would call it a contract service organization because it may not be just research, it could be any kind of contract that you get from a company. So what what is this uh, CRO, CSO kind of thing? It is a company, if companies usually want to do some small projects internally where they may not be having the capacity or they may not have the expertise to do some small research project or something that they're testing or they are doing some, um, you know, something about uh, GMP based things that they want to test. It's just a pilot testing, it's not the real thing. But they they cannot do it internally because they just don't have the expertise or they don't know if they should go into that area or not. So what they do is they give us a contract and we work on that internally and give them the results. And uh, by the way, that model has been used quite a bit in the industry. The clinical research guys always do this kind of a model. Now, BioLink had a summit uh, in April of 2012 where they uh, talked about a variety of different ways of doing this contract research and contract service um, organization. And using that model, they're, they're, at the summit, they they came up with different models of how to do this. There were two models that were very conspicuous. The CRO, CSO model, what is called, uh, uh, this is for the purpose of educating students, where a contract is drawn up between the company and the college, and then you it, it basically help the companies to accelerate their um, commercialization process. The project is run by the school personnel. It's um, there's a project manager, there is an intern who works on it. This way the students get uh, the benefit out of this whole CRO uh, uh, model. And it is done either at a company or at the school, depending on how the company feels. Sometimes they would like to do it internally, which is fine. But sometimes they don't have that equipment, and if the school has the equipment, it, they'll just let you do it in the school. And it's just like, you know, projects that have beginning and end of the project. So this is one of the models that was um, identified. The other model that was identified was the industry experience model, what is uh, where it is more like a student internship model. Usually a ca it's a capstone course for a program. Uh, the student may or may not work on the identified pro pro project. It could be just that, you know, sometimes the students are not at the level where they can work on this project, so it will be mostly the uh, faculty or somebody identified internally who will work on it. But it will be supervised by the company personnel most of the time. In that summit, they were also looking at measuring the economic impact of these uh, CSOs or CROs. Um, one of the metrics that was uh, uh, talked about was the 
uh, bio innovation gateway matrix which is basically you know doing a CRO like this in a college or in an area uh, of interest would be savings in cost of the operation so imagine a small company they don't have enough resources or enough funding to do whatever they want whereas in many schools what happens is you uh, you have grants you have variety of professors working on different things and there will be a lot of equipment that will be available and this can be used by the area industry to um, cut cost of their operation. And a lot of jobs will be created in this process. Number of uh, FDA applications approved. They look at these metrics to see whether it's a success or not. What is the revenue that the company has generated based on this uh, CRO uh, program that they started? or they uh, work with, in, with, uh, with the school, the sales, and the venture capital funds that attracted. So sometimes we have seen that a company will um, uh, have a venture uh, company interested in what they are doing, but they, they'll say, hey, look, if you meet this, and if you give me this result, I'll give you $10 million after that. So uh, this is a very small company. There are like two people working in there. So they, they came to us and they said, hey, look, um, can we do this testing in the next six months if I get this result I will be in a better shape so we actually did that project and they did get the money afterwards and uh, the results were really really helpful for the company to move forward so it was a very big win for uh, the company and it, it was a very big win for us because our students got to do the internships while this was happening and they got to hi get hired once they got the money um, and then there is the St. Louis Community Economic Council metrics, uh, with which m here the metrics are looked at total wages that it generates, jobs created or the number of employees that they have, investment returns of the startup, which was something that I was just talking about, number of patents that are generated, and uh, capital attracted from non-VC resources like you know federal funding, state funding, and many different other uh, non-VC uh, related uh, resources. So there are variety of matrix, um, sorry, metrics you can use to identify whether this CRO is an important thing uh, for that region or not. Now the model adopted by ACC, you know what happens is there may be some of these models that are there but then when you start working on some on the CRO usually you come up with a slight variation of the model that was proposed it doesn't have to be strictly that as long as it is you know generating enough uh, revenue enough uh, uh, win for both the parties it doesn't matter you can adopt the model as however is required the model adopted by ACC was it was easy for us to draw the um, contract between our continuing education where they do customized training because they have done this with the semiconductor industry for a very long time in Austin. So they knew how to draw the contract up. Uh, safety will approve the contract. For us safety is a big thing because as you all know we work with uh, some of the hazardous material which have to be trained properly how to use that and all that stuff. Adjunct faculty run the project. Usually we identify an adjunct faculty who is uh, worked in that area before or who has the expertise in that area and we pick interns uh, who are uh, we have an internship which is a capstone uh, course for us some of the interns come and say hey I really like that project I want to work in that company at some point so can I do this project so we usually take those interns on the project and the project is uh, conducted at the school or at the company again like I said before you uh, depending on what is available where and what the company feels comfortable sometimes you you know you do it in school or in the company uh, so our initial CSO project have saved the companies about uh, a quarter million dollars so far and it has accelerated commercialization by at least two years I have a lot of uh, data from that. I don't want to show all that right now. There's been a lot of success stories from our uh, three-year CSO or CRO that we have been running here at the biotech program in ACC. 
um, it has provided a better educa business education as well, you know, how, how to do project management. Some students are very interested in project management, so that really helps them to learn how to manage these things. And uh, training to faculty uh, to manage projects. Also, some of the faculty learn as they go along how to manage these projects. So we've had really good successes. Some of our students have come back and said, you know, that was something that I had never done before and that really landed me this job that I always dreamed of. So, And the companies have given us feedback. Uh, they, how that was measured by how much time they saved, how much money they saved, and what infrastructure that they didn't have was available to them. And also they are looking, uh, a lot of them are looking at the GMP certified space, which is very hard to find sometimes. Uh, you, they just want a small space so that they can pilot, study their product so that they can see if they can be launching in the right way or manufacture it under this CGMP condition, will it change anything, things like that, they can, you know, study this before they put in a lot of money to set up a huge manufacturing space for themselves. Also, a lot of business acumen is learned as we go along. And so we've got a lot of uh, feedback from the companies saying this is something that saved a lot of money and time for them and got very good resources. Now, I have a question for all of you. Is any of your organization interested in starting a CRO, CSO type of things in your colleges or in any organization? Looks like you ought to do another whole webinar on this stuff. Uh, Sue, there's people that are saying yes and, and possibly looks like there's a lot of interest. Yeah. Yeah, we could do that in the future webinars. And there's a lot of information actually on the BioLink website from that summit we had. So if you go on the BioLink website, you can look at the summit report. That gives you an idea of a lot of different things that can be done. And we are always here to, you know, help you out with this new AC2 Regional Center. One of the goals is to set up new CROs, CSOs, and to help them out. We are even thinking of making like a course in a box kind of thing where we give all information on how to start a CRO. Well, thank you. I'm going to move us forward one slide here. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, that's... Keep all this. That's fine. Yeah, I think, um, is should this be here? Did we fail to take this out, Sue? So? Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry. Just move on. Okay. I'll, I'll I'm move. just, oh, oh, I'm sorry. There yeah. we go. Okay, good. Yeah. I have a question for you that came up, uh, and then we'll go into our final set of questions. Is it expensive to set up, or how much does it cost? Suppose I'm here at my college and I want to set up a CXO or CSO. How much money should I think about uh, for setup? Is there a setup cost? Actually, I would say if your labs are quite well equipped, you really don't have a setup cost. Um, because what we did, and I'll tell you our experience at ACC, we had a um, new lab that, that was started. About, I mean, I say new, but it's been already five, six years now. Um, but we had a, a whole set of equipment that we got from different grants. and. Uh, we uh, use some of the lab space. The biggest challenge will be when the company wants to come and do it inside your lab here. Uh, so we dedicated a small room just for this CRO kind of project. So it has a, it has a, it has everything in there, uh, lab benches, it has a sink and everything. So if you're planning to start a new um, lab, it would be good to have that in mind and then start. So, so that you can dedicate a space to that. But really, there's no startup cost in that sense. Because most of the time, if you see, uh, and I've seen many projects so far, they are all lacking with equipment. And if you have the equipment with you, then I think you're ahead of the game. OK, well, thank you for that answer. Uh, folks, as we get now to the final part of our webinar, I've got a couple of questions that came up that I'd like to address, and we're just probably spend another five minutes here on this. Uh, Sandy, for you, several people commented they liked where you uh, 
that little part of the website where you talked about the TLAs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> the three-letter acronyms. I couldn't help uh, resist doing it, but several comments came in how useful that is uh, to students because that lingo is uh, is often in you know. Uh, a barrier, I suppose, in some ways. It's something that students have to get over. So they appreciated your doing that. So I just wanted to pass along that comment to you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, here's a hard question now. And I think I'll start with Elaine. And I might ask Jeanette to chime in as well. Elaine, um, the question is, I'm trying to start a biotech program here and running into two issues. I've got to demonstrate industry need, right, that there's jobs out there. And then they're running into this Department of Education requirement. Are you familiar with it, Elaine, that talks about gainful employment, how you have to demonstrate gainful employment? Do you have, can you address that, Elaine, those two questions? They're similar. I can address them, and we probably will have other people that can chime in, too. Um, we have uh, an example of a local survey, that sample survey, that on the BioLink website that has been useful for some people in their region because every program wants to uh, pretty much tailor their program to the regional needs. But um, there's also some, there's a nice uh, report that John Carice did. He's the, a labor market analyst and a center of excellence director at City College of San Francisco, and he did a report uh, on middle skill jobs, and they. Uh, use burning glass to uh, identify the actual names of the jobs. And what has happened is that there's been a lot of uh, available information about really high-end uh, biotech jobs. And then also uh, you know, very basic jobs like dishwashing. But the kind of technician that we're training um, has it's in the middle. It requires some some college education, but not necessarily a bachelor's degree. The other thing that I could mention is that uh, the Battelle report every year comes out, and it's uh, on the bio uh, website. And it divides up uh, every state in the uh, United States and talks about emerging uh, industries in biotech and where the focus is in those states. And that is a very good resource to also um, uh, take a look at and use because it comes out annually. So it's, it's a nice, up-to-date uh, publication. Do uh, any of the other presenters have uh, any other comments on that? Well, I, yeah, I would just say that you know all of this is really local. I mean, you probably need to have some, a lot of local partners, and maybe your trade organization. Um, make some make some friends and find out who to talk to to get that industry need documented. Um, you know, it's one of those chicken and eggs. I mean, industry doesn't know they need it till they have it kind of thing. So it's 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 a little tricky to get it started. I'm not as familiar with the gainful employment uh, hoops. Uh, I know I've heard the language, but I'm not exactly sure what you have to do to demonstrate gainful employment. So maybe we need to do a little research on that so that we can provide more guidance uh, along those lines. Uh, I, I agree with you. I can uh, add. Local trade organizations are excellent. And I also think that uh, in, in this industry, a lot of people get their experience with a temp job. So the temp agencies are also very good. And they're, they're pretty good about uh, providing uh, feedback on the need of the industries in the region. So that's another whole thing. I'm not. Uh, able to address the second question either about the gainful employment uh, regulations. I would need to look at those and then, uh, but it's, thanks for the question, because now I can go back and look at those uh, regulations more carefully. I would guess that it's um, addressing employment that will actually lead to full time, I mean, paid employment and uh, leading to uh, some kind of pathway for uh, a career within the industry, rather than just a uh, unpaid internship, for example. Sandy had a comment, too. Oh, yeah. I wanted to add that, let's say 
Let's say that you knew in your area that an aspect of biotechnology, like medical devices, was becoming more and more important and more and more companies were involved in it. One thing you could do would be to go to the BioLink website and you could look at the degrees that are offered and you could see if any programs in your area are offering degrees that are related to medical device technology. So you can use some of our data to argue that, look, we've got all these companies here, there aren't, there aren't any PRAMs offering this degree. No, we're not comprehensive. We don't have every single program in the country, but it's a pretty good sample. So you could at least know if something exists or not that would already meet industry needs. That's a good point, Sandy. Thank you. Let me ask. I, I wanted to add one more thing. Go the, ahead, WIBs, the WIBs that are out there in your local area, they are very helpful because they'll actually give you the right uh, uh, idea of what industry is out there. Even in biotech, you know, there may be devices, there may be biomanufacturing. So if you talk to the WIBs, they actually can give you more information. The Workforce Investment Board, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, workforce Investment Board. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or Workforce Commission. They're called different in different places, I think. That's a good idea, Sue. One more. Let's start with Elaine on this last one, and then I'll ask Jeanette also. Um, if I'm starting, it's back to if I'm starting a biotech program, do you think I should think of it as a transfer program up to a four-year, or will I have, or should I think of it as a program that's graduating, you know, AAS folks that are going to get out and get jobs? How, do, how should I think about it? Well, I would address that by looking at the, uh, the students that are coming into our program. And across the country, most of the students that are coming in are uh, more mature students. They're not coming directly from high school. So they're career changers. Their uh, skill builders is sometimes used to uh, uh, name these kinds of students who are really looking at getting the skills they need to get a job. And many of these students already have bachelor's degrees in some, in some area. It doesn't have to even be a science. But the idea of creating a program that addresses the needs of industry for skills is really the focus. What we also find is that many students enter a program with the idea of getting a job and only coming for a certificate or for a few short courses or for the AS degree, but many get hooked and want to go on. And so that does become a problem because those that want to go on, these courses are not necessarily transferable to four-year institutions. Right now in the state of California, we have two colleges, Maricosta in the south and Solano Community College in the north, that are beginning to offer in the fall bachelor's degrees in biomanufacturing. So that's a whole trend now that community colleges are beginning to offer these technical baccalaureate degrees. Jeanette, you're going to add something to that? <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think the short answer is it's difficult to serve two masters. Um, it would be, in a perfect world, it would be, as Elaine mentioned there at the end, where we had um, workforce-oriented bachelor degrees. Uh, but the reality is, in most cases, we don't. They're very academically oriented, and they don't accept the credits that we offer that are actually very much geared toward workforce uh, education and have students getting the skills they need to, to get a job. Um, if you start trying to serve both masters, it just it becomes very complicated. I guess it's not a, it's not a pat answer, but that's kind of the best I can do. I guess I would add to that that if you're applying for a National Science Foundation ATE project or center, the focus of ATE is on the preparation of technicians and at community and technical colleges. So that uh, depends a little bit on the funding. If you've got funding, a different kind of funding, that could uh, drive that decision as well. Those are good points. 
Well, that brings us to our final wrap-up slides. I'm going to move forward in just a second, but I did want to compliment you, Elaine, and your colleagues on this huge national infrastructure you've set up that really supports programs. I mean, the, the sort of people that are on the call with us today, they're frankly amazed that all this is available to help them start their programs and sustain their programs. So uh, I, I just want to compliment you on that. Let me move forward here and, and take us uh, and remind us of what's coming up. Right, Elaine, we're, we're talking about the webinar on May 13th using uh, a focus on biotechcareers.org for exploring careers. So we're looking forward to that. And everybody in the world is going to turn into the CRISPR webinar in August, September time frame because everyone wants to know about more about CRISPR because that's all they read about today in the newspapers. So uh, I'm, exagger I'm exaggerating there a little bit. But I want to hear more well, about it. Well, you're not exaggerating too much because uh, that's a technology that's really uh, hot and changing uh, uh, the way the biotech uh, research is being done. So it's, uh, I was at the AAAS meeting in uh, Washington, and the CRISPR uh, sessions were completely full. There was not even standing room only. So, and I know that Tom Tubon has been uh, teaching uh, whole areas on CRISPR at uh, Madison Area Technical College. And uh, yeah. John Carcianis is a high school teacher, and he's used teaching CRISPR in his high school class in San Francisco. So once, we're the, once yeah. the technology is available, it, then it becomes uh, important for us to uh, know how to use it and incorporate it into our uh, right. professional development. Well, friends, uh, let me just have our final closing comments today. BioLink, and you know, the future, Elaine, you, you stress this is an active community of practice, right? We have, and and uh, we started out this national center with a model of distributed leadership, as you can well see. We we identified people around the country that had not just borderline skills, but were major players. And uh, curriculum was very strong at Madison Area Technical College, and they still uh, run the uh, curriculum and instructional materials clearinghouse. Uh, for the BioLink National Center. But we want to make sure that we continue to invite the involvement of new people. And that's why Sandra Porter pointed out on the home page of the BioLink website a place to join. And currently the joining is free. We'll look, be looking for uh, opportunities to keep the center funded. But at some point, we, we want to work this out together. So we've got uh, 501c3 possibilities. We've got a number of thoughts about keeping the center going. But the cer certainly the, the main point is that we are uh, very actively looking at ways to keep all of this, uh, these materials and uh, uh, professional development and uh, involvement of people together. And of course, the new regional center, AC Squared at Austin Community College, is providing some leadership in that as well. As how, when we first started BioLink, Austin Community College didn't even have a biotech program. They're, and they, with Lynette Fletcher as the regional director at that time, look at where they've come. So this is exactly what we want to encourage everybody that's on the call, that's thinking of starting a program, to get involved with the whole national and now international community. That's pretty much it, Mike. Thank you so much that's great. for your organization. It's a great message, Elaine. And so uh, everyone, this concludes our webinar. And what I'm going to do now is ask for your help. I'm going to la launch a survey with just a couple of questions. And I'd like you to uh, please respond to it. That's going to help us uh, as we go forward here. Uh, we appreciate your attending today. I, I just thought it was great, your overview, Elaine. And Sandy, the website work is just amazing. Jeanette, the, the movie things we're very excited about. And boy, uh, Sulatha, the, uh, 
that CXO stuff, CSO, a lot of interest uh, from community colleges are doing something like that today. So this officially concludes our webinar. Presenters, you, should, you can just go ahead and, and log off at this point. We'll leave the survey up for a few minutes so that people can give us their feedback about future webinars. Thank you again for joining today. I'm going to conclude the recording and uh, remind you that you will be sent a link to the recording and the slides in the next couple of business days. Goodbye, everyone.